Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our uh, series on Sharia law that we called Sharia law, the Islamic Talmud. And last episode, we talked about the authority of the scholars. We're talking about the scholars who are considered to be Sharia law scholars. And uh, we showed that Muslims are really uh, uh, prohibited from questioning these scholars. But today, we are going to at least evaluate this further. And with me here, of course, to do so, our dear brother Lloyd. Lloyd, thank you so much for being here, as always. And uh, if you can maybe uh, this time elaborate a little bit more about what you've covered last time concerning the authority of the scholars or the scholars of Sharia law. Yeah, thank you, Alfani. Very good to be back with you. So I will refer here to the Reliance of the Traveler. I will highlight a few pages within the book and invite everyone to look at those pages for themselves, download the resource, read it, see the evidence for yourself. So if we switch to my shared screen, you'll see a couple of points that are made here. They speak of the difference of qualifications for the imam of a school and a judge or a mufti. The former's competence in giving opinion is absolute. And this, we've said previously, this is absolute. So this corroborates that, that these imams of the four schools, their knowledge of Islam is absolute. No one else can ever contradict them. This extends to all matters in the sacred law. And the competence of a judge or mufti is limited to judging court cases or to applying his imam's ijtihad to particular questions. So they apply the law. They don't create. The sharia has already been created. The fiqh has already been created. And Islamic scholarship has not accepted anyone's claims to absolute ijtihad since imams Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, and Ahmad. So their scholarship is absolute. No one can come along after them and change Islamic law and reinterpret kind of, Islamic yeah, law. And of course, of they say to urge them, yes. As it's kind of interesting because who decided that, you know, technically speaking? They decided that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, there is one scholar above them, Al Ghazali. He sits above them. But in, in a very real sense. But to urge that a mujtahid is not divinely protected from error, called ma'asum, is as of little relevance to his work as the fact that a major physicist is not divinely protected from simple errors in calculus. They basically dismiss any claim of error from these people because they say that, that the, the fact that these people would have made an error is negligible. Any mistakes they've made are negligible. So you're not allowed to criticize them or point out errors. And yet Muslims, to defend Islam, will do exactly that. Right. And secondly, the lack of verification of the actual positions of the Mujtahid. So they speak of those who want to come later on. They have no authority. They, they're not considered as authoritative. Now, for instance, it says here, by consensus of all the scholars, this verse, ask those who recall if you know not. It's an imperative for someone who does not know a ruling in sacred law or the evidence to follow someone who does, taklid. Virtually all scholars of fundamentals of Islamic law have made this verse the principal evidence. It is obligatory, obligatory for the ordinary Muslim to follow the scholar who is a mujtahid. So that, again, just consistently, we are told that Muslims must follow the scholars. That's what we're always told. Have you consulted a scholar? And yes, that's exactly what we are doing right now. So let's continue. And they speak of scholars who were with Muhammad, the companions, were at various levels of knowledge in religion. Not all of them were capable of giving formal legal opinion, nor was the religion taken from all of them. So not everyone who has an opinion, Muslims will often point to scholar A or scholar B or companion A or companion B, but that is not necessarily a relevant opinion. It's a record, recorded opinion, but not necessarily of any relevance. Okay. Right. And notice here, Ibn Hazm's report that most of the companions' legal opinions came from only seven of them. And they mention here, Umar, Ali, Ibn Masud, Ibn Umar, Ibn Abbas, Zaid Ibn Tabit, and Aisha. And this was from thousands of the companions. So basically, there's a very limited pool of people whose opinions are valid within Islam. And it is not that of the opinion, well, the opinion of the guy in the YouTube comment section with an anonymous name who's defending Islam, his opinion is not valid. Right. And it's kind of so, interesting, by the way, you mentioned there one of those seven is Ibn Mas'ud. Yet when it comes to the Quran, Ibn Mas'ud's claim to how many uh, chapters are in the Quran or the way uh, some verses should be read is ignored. 
So you can yes. see the contradictions. I wish Islam made sense. I wish yeah. all of this made sense. Yes, <laughs> very well spotted, Al Fadi. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And also notice they mention here that the learned among them would unhesitatingly answer their questions without alluding to mention of evidence. In other words, Muslims should not ask for evidence. They should simply accept what they were given and just believe it and accept it and apply it and live according to it. There should be no issue of wanting evidence, right? And yeah, that's that's kind of interesting, by the way, Lloyd. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Sure, but, sure, no, uh, please, please. Because please. anytime something comes to mind, if you recall, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who's one of those seven that their uh, authority basically emanated to uh, the other scholars, uh, burned some infidels, and he was even cr criticized for doing so by other companions because there was no precedence yes. for it. Fascinating. So I think if we look through this some more and actually had a discussion on this, we'd, we'd find just how fractured early Islam was and just how little sense it makes and why they have this facade of having agreement, although there is one because they operate obviously, but 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 yet they like to claim that God is not a God of confusion and Christianity is confused and everyone's confused. And yet within Islam, we can point to egregious issues where, where there's great confusion. So they, they speak here that there is unquestionable established transmission so that there is no issues in terms of the received knowledge, right? And thus, there should be no doubt. No one should ever question this. And because they say that this is utterly established, no one should even bother to check the evidence. They don't need such. They just need to hear and obey. Right. Okay. Now, notice they mentioned the surahs of the Quran, all of its verses, and all of the hadiths, which have reached us by so many channels, belief in them is obligatory, right? It is mutawatir, and it is unquestionably established transmission. Now, what's interesting, they mentioned that this is mutawatir, yet there's a debate within the scholarship, just how many of the Quran's verses are actually mutawatir. Some say seven, some say five, some even say one. And so yet there's no consistency and no consensus even amongst that. So what is the level of reliability if the Quran maybe has only one verse that is utterly reliable? So again, right. this scholarship goes against what we are commonly told within Islam, and it causes, again, great confusion. And of course, they believe that it is impossible that the various channels could all have conspired to fabricate them. And yet, Muslims will tell you that these hadiths are not authentic. These hadiths are not reliable. So, all right. So I will, let me, I'll just wrap this up here. Uh, let me, so pause for a second, because I will need to just get to the scholarly consensus. Okay, back to the ijma. Just remind everyone, all mujtahids of the Muslims in the period of the thing or event agree on its ruling, regardless of their country, race, or group. Now, what they are referring to here is really the founding imams, right? the early imams. But notice they state that non-mujtahids are of no consequence. So in other words, if you have an opinion from someone in the comment section, someone who's not a mujtahid, his interpretation of Islam is of no consequence and should be disregarded in favor of those of the scholars of relevance. Mm -hmm. So, and the ruling agreed upon is an authoritative part of sacred law that is obligatory to obey and not lawful to disobey. Mujtahids even of a succeeding generation, right? They cannot make the thing an object of new ijtihad because the ruling on it is verified by scholarly consensus. It is an absolute ruling which does not admit of being contravened or annulled. And they speak here. So in other words, if it is in the Sharia, it cannot be changed. It is absolute. It is fixed for all time. And the proof of the legal authority of scholarly consensus is that Allah said he ordered the believers in the Quran to obey him and his messenger and to obey those of authority. And so those of authority are the ones who are telling the Muslims today, this is what the ijma is. This is what the Sharia says. Obey it. And they are not to be questioned. They don't have to provide evidence. Any thoughts from you, Al-Fadi? It was kind of interesting because, um, you know, in another episode that I was doing with Dr. J. Smith concerning the uh, Quran and its evolution, one passage actually in the past used to uh, talk about uh, the obedience of uh, of Allah, and then later in in the current Quran, it added the phrase Allah and the Prophet. So 
it, it's it's really confusing because you you start to wonder uh, was this added at a later time? Meaning the scholars. <laughs> I mean, are they are you required now to obey the scholars just because of controversies maybe that arose or uh, you know tension between the schools and so on and so forth? Those are very interesting points because we will see later that when the Sharia was being developed historically, when we go into the the founding imams, they were claiming much later, hundreds of years after Muhammad died, that earlier companions had said this or done this, and therefore it was valid and had to be followed. But yet there's no evidence for that necessarily. So they were just making wild claims. So they were giving themselves authority. They were right. taking authority. They were usurping authority and making claims, which are probably historically specious. So yeah. to wind down here, I need to say, so my community shall not agree on an error. So apparently the scholars cannot make mistakes and therefore scholars today who are mujtahids cannot make mistakes because they are coming from laws that are perfect. And these scholars have achieved safety from textual corruption, have been able to discern the genuine from the poorly authenticated. So in other words, there is no way these scholars can ever be wrong. And yet, if you go to the scholars, you can look at other sources that tell you that Muhammad made mistakes. I'll pause here, Al-Fadi. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you, of course, for these explanations. It's fascinating. And I hope that people, of course, will uh, understand further. And, and I have to admit, folks, uh, not every Muslim you're going to meet have this knowledge, by the way, that uh, our brother here is sharing with you. And I hope you guys will appreciate uh, his work, uh, research uh, the, the uh, links that will be provided to you, uh, for you, and even go to his website, which is named after him, and, and subscribe to it because uh, this is fascinating. Brother, what are we going to talk about next time? So we'll briefly speak of the pillars of the Sharia, and then we will move from there to the historical aspects of Islam, the founding of the schools of fiqh and how this happened over time, something which is very relevant to what you discussed with Jay. Very good. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is Al-Fadi, over and out. God bless. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sira International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.